good afternoon and welcome to CSIS. Uh, I'm John Alterman, Senior Vice President at the Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and the Director of the Middle East Program. And it is a great pleasure to welcome Qubad Talabani back to Washington. We miss you. you. I miss Washington. Qubad spent <laughs> almost a decade here uh, in the 2000s playing a, a remarkable role, being a, a spokesman for uh, the Kurdistan region of Iraq, being a person who brought uh, Iraqis and Americans together, being a person who learned how Washington worked better than perhaps most Washingtonians. Uh, he is now back in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, where he is the deputy prime minister of the Kurdistan regional government. Uh, in the seventh cabinet, that is the one before he assumed his current job in June, he was the minister and head of the Department of Coordination and Follow-up. Uh, he is a person who I think those of us who worked with him in Washington uh, hold in a, a very high esteem, a person who has tremendous promise uh, for the future of the Kurdistan region of Iraq and for Iraq itself. And I'm, with no further ado, I'm pleased to introduce to you, reintroduce to you, uh, Kuba Talibani. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, um, friends, ambassador, um, colleagues. It is um, really a great feeling to be back in Washington. I, I miss Washington. I miss coming to CSIS, even though since I left, I've come back. You've moved into much swankier facilities. Congratulations on that. Um, but it's great to see so many old friends here. Um, delighted to be back here. Although I'm here for a, a short period of time um, to primarily update um, friends in the administration and in the policy community and on the Hill on some of the developments um, in Iraq and Kurdistan, but also to get a better sense of where the administration, where the United States is going in terms of how it intends to implement its policy to degrade and ultimately destroy ISIL. Um, so. I wanted to just briefly talk about a few different issues. One is um, to start with some positive news. Uh, and so much of what we talk about Iraq and Kurdistan over the last few years has been to do with conflict and disagreements and, and lack of political progress. I'd like to start off with, with some positive news. It was just over a week ago that I was part of a delegation that was in Baghdad. Um, speaking with the new government um, in Baghdad, and, and we were able to uh, reach uh, an agreement on two very pressing uh, and, and important issues. One is on the issue of um, oil exports, and the other was on the issue of budget issues. And these, these were two very contentious issues, and, and I will preface that these agreements are, it's a temporary agreement, it's a very important first step towards what we hope will be a more lasting and more sustainable uh, agreement. Um, we immediately noticed a very different atmosphere in Baghdad when we arrived. Um, we felt a much more positive reception um, by our colleagues um, in Baghdad. And I think that contributed um, to what I consider a, a very successful few days and a very successful and important first step to start to build a trust that had been eroded at for the last several years. The agreement, which I'm sure has been made quite public um, to many of you, um, is twofold. One is that Kurdistan would contribute uh, 250,000 barrels of oil to the national exports. At the same time, um, will allow for passage of uh, 300,000 barrels of oil from the Kirkuk fields um, through Kurdistan's pipeline and out into the international markets. In return, we will get our share of the federal budget, which had been withheld from us since fe February of, of this year, as well as a partial payment towards um, the Peshmerga forces, the Kurdish security forces, um, which is, is a very important first step because it's really the first time um, that we've been able to reach some sort of agreement on the issue of payments towards um, the Peshmerga. So this is a, it's a positive first step. I don't want to bill it as the complete agreement we have now. Um, this, this, this agreement has to be ratified 
um, in the budget law of 2015, which we hope will go um, immediately in, in January, will be put into the parliament, hopefully will be voted on. Then we basically have a year um, to work with our colleagues in Baghdad to reach a more sustainable agreement on the issues of revenue sharing, on the issues of hydrocarbons as a whole, issues of Peshmerga and incorporating the Kurdish security forces into a broader national um, structure. So we, we were, we were um, positively um, impressed with the pragmatism and, uh, and the practical nature of, of Prime Minister Abadi and, and how he handled the negotiations. And we, we again, I'll um, caution, you know, I'll try to refrain from getting too ahead of myself, but I think we're expecting a different way of communicating and a different way of cooperating, and, 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 and it is very positive. This obviously comes amid a backdrop of um, a war that Iraq is facing um, and a war Iraq is engaging in against uh, the so-called Islamic State. Um, the Kurdistan forces are uh, front and center uh, at this war against the so-called Islamic State. We today in Kurdistan have eight fronts now open uh, against this group. Um, it's hard to know what to call them. Um, the ISIL, ISIS, the Islamic State, whatever we call them, whatever name we designate for them, the one thing that we have to be very clear on is that this is a very dangerous organization. And they're dangerous in a way that um, previous iterations of terrorist organizations that have taken foothold in Iraq um, have not been as dangerous as this because this group actually controls territory. This group is not a shadowy terrorist organization hiding in houses, in caves, or in mountains in, um, in parts of the country. This organization um, has taken over a large portion of the country and is it actually administering in portions of this country. And, and this is what makes them different from Ansar al-Islam or Ansar al-Sunnah or some of the other groups that we've had, to, even al-Qaeda in Iraq, that, that we've had to deal with from 2003 up until today. What also makes them dangerous is that their territory is not just confined to one country. There is today no border between Iraq and Syria. Uh, and that's what makes it even more complicated. The one thing that is for certain, though, is the so-called Islamic State did not fill a security void in the country. The country had and has a robust security service. The ISIL filled a, a political void in the country. And they, they were born out of a failure of politics in Iraq, uh, and they were able to capitalize on the disenfranchisement of a big portion of the country um, as a result of successive failed policies up until today. So any end game plan to, to eradicate, degrade, and so ultimately destroy this group has to have a strong political component to it. It can't just be looked at in pure military terms that we need this number of troops and this type of weapon and this type of operation to eradicate this group. There has to be lessons learned from the surge. If we recall, we've done this once before. There was a concerted effort, a coordinated effort to wipe out then what was then Al-Qaeda in Iraq and Zarqawi's group. Um, the military component of the surge worked. The areas were able to be cleared, but the hold and the build side of the surge plan didn't actually take place because politics never grew. The politics that was required for the various different groups to come together and come around a sort of vision for the country never transpired. So that's why this time around, parallel to any military attempts to eradicate this group, which have to happen, have to happen. Parallel to that has to be a stronger political solution to make this military operation um, sustainable. And that requires greater coordination between Kurdish forces and the rest of uh, the forces in the rest of the country, the Iraqi armed forces, but also greater cooperation with the coalition forces and, and, and in particular um, the United States. So uh, as a result of the conflict and as a result of these eight fronts, um, Kurdistan has um, also been burdened 
with a major humanitarian crisis. Today we have 1.5 million internally displaced people that have sought refuge in Kurdistan. And when you think of our population being around 5 million people, this is a huge number and a major burden on our resources and on our government's ability to provide the necessary health care, education, electricity, water and sanitation services to these IDPs uh, uh, and refugees. So, um, so we are facing several different kinds of problems. The political problem in the country, the military and security problem, but also now parallel to that, a humanitarian problem. Um, so it's important for, for me in, in my visit here and for us back home to get a better sense of U.S. policy here and, and how the U.S. intends to ultimately um, destroy this group. There are willing partners on the ground. The Iraqi government, the Iraqi armed forces have, have, have regrouped after the initial shock of this group and are now fighting admirably against ISIL. The Kurdish forces, the same. But we all understand that we are limited in what we can do. We are limited in how effective we can ultimately be against this group. So greater coordination is required and greater cooperation is going to be um, required. Ultimately, again, I will, I will conclude by saying that this is a, a political problem um, and, and, and we have to come to an understanding that, that there, is great, there was great disappointment um, after the surge, that the politics didn't resolve. And people in Mosul, people in Anbar, people in Salah Haddin, um, felt that the promises that were made to them back then were never fully delivered upon. So it's very important this time around that there is a more holistic approach to this and a better understanding that in order for this country of Iraq to work, and I want to make very clear here, the Kurdish side, the Kurdish leadership, has made a decision to try its best to make Iraq work. We, we made this agreement when we chose to join um, the current government uh, of Iraq. This was a political decision that the political leadership of Kurdistan made to, to assist in giving Iraq one last chance to, to make it work. We will be committed to that, and we have been committed to that. But in order for Iraq to work, it's not just a matter of Iraq reconciling its differences with the Kurds. Iraq has to reconcile its differences with the Sunnis. There has to be better political inclusion. There has to be a political system that governs in Iraq that reflects the diversity of Iraqi society. And, and we have to step away from the notions of this centralized rule of Iraq in, in dominating Iraq from the political center. Because Iraq today is fractured. Iraq today is occupied by a foreign, by an alien force. Uh, an alien force that, for better or for worse, rightly or wrongly, has at least, at best, acquiescence from parts of the communities in Iraq. So we need to change this dynamic. We need to get people to turn against this so-called Islamic State. And we can't just do that with words. We can't just do that by including Sunni members into the government. There has to be better policies nationwide. There has to be more inclusion. Uh, and that requires a shift in focus. Um, from Baghdad, but also from the United States in coming up with a vision for the country that, that will make the country work. We are willing to play our part to make Iraq work. We are willing to play our part to help shape that vision. Um, but that requires not two to tango in this case, but several of us to tango um, in this case. And I think that if there is the political will, and um, we're starting to sense that, that there may be a different atmosphere and greater will to, to come to terms with the realities in the country, it may just work. But it is the country's last chance, um, and, and it's facing major, major challenges um, from a group that is intent on staying in, in Iraq. And, and with that, I want to thank you for, for the opportunity. Happy to answer questions that you have and engage in a lively discussion that I'm, I know that CSIS always um, generate. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for inviting me here and, and giving me this chance to catch up with old friends. I thank appreciate you. that. Um, well, Hubad has to, uh, to leave promptly at 3. <coughs> Until then, he's all ours. I suggest that in order to maximize the utility of our time, that we try to go around uh, with questions that um, everybody identify yourself to ask uh, just one question until we've had a chance 
<clears throat> to go around, and my pet peeve, as many of you know, is questions that aren't really questions, but rather statements saying, what do you think of my statement? So if we could avoid that, I would be grateful. I will try to model this. I'm John Alterman. I work here at CSIS. <laughs> um, whenever, when I talk to the most thoughtful people I know about Iraq, the thing they are terrified about is that in pursuing the Islamic State, we will be empowering Shia militias, which will prove to be the long-term threat <clears throat> to the success of Iraq. What do you think Iraqis need to do to prevent that from happening? And what would you like to see outsiders do to try to avoid that eventuality from coming about? I, I think it's a, it's a genuine fear, and it's something that you know, we would have hoped, all of us would have hoped, that the conventional forces in Iraq were, should have stood up to the job and should have done their job in, in defending the country. And I think that basically reinforces um, what I was trying to say earlier in the sense that this is not just a security problem, it's not a security vacuum. Um, ISIL being in Iraq uh, and covering a large portion of the territory is really it's a political problem. And there has to be, a, I think, ultimately a political solution um, to get people to stand up and, and reject ISIS and, and shun them away. Uh, and I think that um, is partly going to require reorganizing, restructuring maybe the Iraqi forces, but that's going to take time. Uh, and I'm hearing, you know, efforts to go, take place. It's going to take six months to reorganize, restructure the forces. I know that the Iraqi Defense Ministry is very eager and gung ho about doing this quickly and, and having the forces there. But I think that if we purely look at this in militaristic terms, I don't think we'll come up with a sustainable um, strategy. How we deal with the militias, I think it's a very complicated issue because the militias, for better or for worse, not talking about any tactics that may have been used, have been effective in, in repelling ISIS and have been effective in, in clearing towns and cities uh, in, in the country. So I think it's going to be equally dangerous just to say, OK, thank you, your job is done. You can now go back to wherever you came from. I think they may want to somehow be included into the, the national defense structure. At the same time, we're also hearing about efforts and, and intentions to arm Sunni tribes, um, to have them take up arms, which I think if it's part of a larger strategy to create regionalized defense forces, um, that's fine. But I think if, if we rush to this and just arm people and say, OK, go and take these arms and, and fight this group, uh, again, if, it, if it's not part of a more cohesive and thought out strategy, it could have disastrous consequences. And these weapons, these efforts immediately being handed over to extremist groups that could turn around and use them against Iraq or against us or against Americans. I mean, this ISIS's ar arm armory is basically the Iraqi army's armory. So what, what would you like outsiders to do to try to head off uh, the, the, the seed of uh, militia rule? I, I think, again, it, it's very difficult, but it has to be, there has to be, we can't just look at this from a military operation view, that this is a military operation, we need to do this and carry out this operation here and eliminate this group here, because again, the root cause of the problem is political. You, you settle the political issues, you can settle the militia issues. The militias will continue to exist if they feel that, that Shiism is under threat by Sunni extremism. Sunni extremism will continue to take hold in Iraq if they feel under threat from Shiite dominance. Kurdish nationalism will continue to grow if we feel that we are pressured by Arab nationalism. Arab nationalism may continue to rise up if they feel the Kurds being too Kurdish nationalists and taking away from Iraqi sovereignty. So here we're talking about psychological issues that these various different communities and groups have vis-a-vis -vis each other. There is lacking trust in the country. So trust that can eventually begin to normalize and stabilize once there is a sound political order in the country that makes me as a Kurd feel that somebody's not trying to take my share and what, what I feel is rightfully owned to us. And that's why I think the way you keep militias or extremism in check is by having sound policies that does not alienate, but that actually makes it more inclusive and brings people together rather than push them apart. Thank you. Right in the front row here. Kubad, great to see you. Uh, Barbara Sladen from the Atlantic Council and almonitor.com. Um, does 
Baghdad have enough money to pay the 17% that they promised you? What is that 17% in dollar uh, terms? And uh, what share should the Sunnis get of the national budget to entice them to remain part of Iraq? Um, you know, we, the Iraqi finance minister is, is a Kurd now and is a good friend to many of you in this room and a good friend to us. And of course, his first day on the job, the first thing we all did as Kurds was call him and say, hey, Uncle Lashar, <laughs> so how about these payments? <laughs> um, and I think he was, he was rather um, pleasantly or un unpleasantly surprised at the state of the country's finances. Uh, unpleasantly surprised. I mean, the, the country is facing massive financial crisis. And we, we thought it was only us in Kurdistan that had massive financial issues. But no, Iraq has massive financial issues. And somebody needs to look into why that is the case. What happened to the reserves? How were they spent? How were they not spent? And I think that requires some sort of investigation somewhere down the line. But the fact of the matter is, Iraq right now, its finances are in trouble. Um, which is why I think uh, adding 550,000 barrels of oil to its exports is going to create a significant increase of revenue for Iraq, which will hopefully be able to pay um, the Kurdistan region its share of the budget. And if you do the math, it actually adds up. Our 17% equates to about 500,000 barrels of oil. That was at oil prices a couple of weeks ago. I had more bad news today that oil prices have continued um, to decline. Now, um, that, that said, you know, the, the more Iraq can boost its production, the greater the revenue um, stream uh, will be. The reality is we're actually not getting 17%. We have never been getting 17% of the budget. I could bore you with the technicalities of it, but I'll try to really keep it simple, is Iraq has something called sovereign expenditures, funding of the army, funding of the government, funding of the parliament expenses that are sovereign. So we get 17% after sovereign expenditures has been taken off the top. Now, we believe that there are certain functions that are sovereign, but we feel that we have certain institutions that are carrying out sovereign duties. Kurdish security forces today are fighting not just on behalf of Kurdistan, but on behalf of all of Iraq. We feel that those forces should be included under sovereign expenditures. Um, oil company costs have been a sovereign expenditure up until today, but not the oil companies operating in Kurdistan. So there's been a double standard on what is sovereign and what is not sovereign. So I think if we can come to terms of, okay, we talk about the 17%, which was actually an agreement that was reached. It actually works out to be between 10 to 11% um, that we get. And obviously it, it depends on um, the, the oil prices and it changes um, each year. but. Ultimately, we in Kurdistan, we need about a billion, um, two billion, three hundred thousand, three hundred million to sustain ourselves a month. Uh, that is to cover the running of the government, uh, the paying of the salaries and the, uh, the payments to uh, kind of the local contractors and overall. And this is after our own spending cuts. And, and one of the things that this war has done, it's made us take a look at ourselves and do a lot of soul searching. We have done, carried out major spending cuts in our government, sometimes as high as 70% in certain ministries. Now, those ministries are still functioning, um, which leads us to believe that there may have been some excessive waste to begin with, which uh, leads us to make the decision that even once money starts to flow, we're going to keep some of those cuts um, in place. Well, I think this is part of the revenue sharing formula, and I think that there needs to be a greater... Uh, a, 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 and this, uh, this is why we have this year now to reach an agreement on the revenue sharing law. That's, that, for me, is the critical piece of legislation because that is the piece of legislation that can really force some sort of unity in the country. And it's not just having the piece of legislation. It's what are the institutions that are in place to actually execute that piece of legislation. Because so many times we have great laws, we have great decisions, but the institutions that are in place to actually execute that causes problems causes delay and, and, and the furthers uh, any mistrust. Yes, sir. My name is Saadi Othman. Hi, Kobal. Good oh, to yes. see you again. Yeah. <laughs> I know you didn't recognize Good to see you. Your, your yeah, hair is um, Mr. Deputy Prime Minister, you mentioned several times in your opening statement and in your responses to John about 
political solutions. This is not just a military thing. You know, everybody is against ISIS, almost everybody, let's say, in Iraq, and they agree on that. Are there any plans for the aftermath? Are there first steps? So, okay, ISIS is gone, as we have seen in certain areas, whether it's in Diyala or further, you know, like south of Baghdad or the, and there were problems, some of it, some of it, or issues, let me say, between Kurds and Arabs in Jalawla and Saudi, as we heard in the last few days, there were certain problems in Jarf al sakhr and in other areas over there. Are there plans and steps taken by all Iraqi leaders from different communities about what to do after ISIS or ISIL is finished and gone so there will not be problems where then there will be serious issues between Kurds and Arabs, Shiites and Sunni and so forth. Thank you. Um, honestly, no. Um, there, aren't, there hasn't been the level of discussion, the strategic discussions that need to be taking place um, between the various communities, the leaders of the various communities, the leaders of the various political parties. Um, there may be discussions inside the federal government. I may not be privy to some of those discussions. The ambassador is in a better place here. Um, I don't want to put him on the spot here. Um, but certainly in terms of a strategic national dialogue on why this happened, how this happened, how this could be prevented from happening, what needs to be done to make the, any attempts to clear these areas successful, no, that hasn't happened yet. And uh, if it doesn't happen, then it won't happen. And if it won't happen, ISIL will remain in, in the country. Uh, uh, Dave Ottaway from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Going back to the oil deal, um, um, could you clarify what was agreed to or not agreed to regarding <coughs> your production beyond 250,000 barrels a day? And I believe you're headed for a million barrels by a year from now. Are you, has Baghdad agreed to allow you to sell uh, the additional oil above the 250,000 barrels on your own? We only discussed with Baghdad, providing Baghdad, providing the government of Iraq, 250,000 barrels from the Kurdish fields, as well as allowing passage of the, the production from Kirkuk's existing fields. We didn't get into any discussions about Kurdish production beyond um, the 250,000, um, but there is a clear understanding that Kurdistan has enormous domestic refining needs um, that I'm certain we will be utilizing any excess production to match and meet those um, refining needs. And by the end of 2015, when we're at a million barrel or 800,000 barrels, depending on if you're looking at it optimistically or pessimistically or realistically, um, we hope to have reached a, a final solution on a sustainable um, agreement with Iraq um, on what to do with all of the production that is coming out of the country, from the north and the south. Thank you. I'm Rafi Danziger, a consultant to APAC. Um, Iraq, of course, has two very powerful neighbors that are very deeply involved in what's happening in Iraq. Could you comment on the roles of Iran and Turkey and what's going on? Thank you. Um, yes, <laughs> our neighbors. Um, Obviously, both have vested interest in, in the country, in the shape of the country, in the future of the country. Um, one, to date, has been more involved than the other. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out which one that is. Um, but ultimately, both have, uh, have, a, have an eye on the country and, and want to see the country pan out in, in, a, in a certain way. Now, uh, Iran has been very actively in involved politically, um, economically and also security-wise, especially in this fight against uh, ISIL. Um, Turkey has been more involved economically and, and politically um, in, in the country, and I think um, it's, you know, it's the nature of, of Iraqi politics and regional <coughs> politics that this, this uh, constellation of countries and interests and, and activities 
coincide sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, but that's, that's uh, an issue that Iraq has had to live with all these years, and I think it's an issue that Iraq has to live with and deal with, and that applies to us in Kurdistan um, going forward. As somebody in the region, do you see the prospect of a unity of goals between the U.S. and Iran in Iraq providing patterns of cooperation which could manifest more broadly in security? A absolutely. I think that there is a unity of goal right now between Iran and the United States, and that is um, the eradication, the elim elimination of, of ISIL. Um, now, whether that will actually transpire into any collaboration, cooperation, open c b work together, that's, um, that's for Iran and America tr to try to work that out. But there is certainly a, a, a uh, commonality and, and the both a sense that ISIL is a threat to Iraq, it's a threat to Iran, it's a threat to the United States, which creates a potential environment for there to be, um, at best, kind of an understanding on how to deal with ISIL collectively or separate, separately. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, good to see you again here in Washington. The Tolga Tanis with you yet. Um, regarding the, the, the political decision that the KRG made on this uh, giving a one last chance to Iraq to work, so what was the main reason to give this last chance to Iraq? Why? Because the President Barzani, when was, he was in here in Washington and when he met with the President, uh, he was very clear if there will be no any progress in this uh, trying to find a solution in these disagreements between the two sides, you are ready to go to referendum and maybe an independence declaration, some kind of this, this development. So what change? And if not now, when? If you give this last chance to Iraq. And w can you elaborate also the meaning of last chance? What, what, what is last chance? I, I, think, I don't think anything um, has changed. We've always said we will do everything we can to make the country work. Um, we've sometimes had, and we continue, and we'll continue to have major disagreements on, on the direction of the country, on the vision of the country going forward. Um, but we've always said we are not going to be the ones that, that break Iraq apart. But we've always said at the same time that we cannot guarantee that Iraq won't break away from us. Um, and that, that ultimately extent requires that collaboration uh, and cooperation. We were very disenfranchised by the former government in Iraq. And I think what, what completely exacerbated us was when the government of Iraq cut the budget of the Kurdistan region. That for us was the, the nuclear option. That was the worst thing that Iraq could have done to us. Um, and, and the arguments that this was done because we were exporting oil um, were not valid because we had not started exporting oil in February. We started exporting oil several months after our budget was cut. But anyway, the budget was cut. It caused major disappointment and anger among the Kurds. It led to the salaries of Iraqi civil servants being cut for several months. And now, even now, we're playing catch up in paying the salaries of our civil servants. It has a major impact on the economy of the Kurdistan region, of the confidence of the investors in the Kurdistan region. So we can obviously say we were, we were irate with that decision. Um, but then the government changed. There was an election and there's an opportunity to form a new government. This new government has been formed. There are a lot of familiar faces in this new government. Uh, and there was obviously a lot of pressure from our friends in the United States, the UK, and, and others to say, let's try to do this, let's try to make this work, let's give it one more chance. And I think it's not a matter of the Kurds giving Iraq one more chance. I think collectively we have come to the determination that, that Iraq can't keep failing like this. It can't keep not reaching the political um, deal that it needs to, to reach because it's, it don't, no longer has the international kind of support and an assistance that it used to get in 2003, 4, 5, 6, and 7. It's, it's pretty much um, left to its own devices. And it's up to Iraq and Iraqis ourselves to, to, to make this work. And you know, hopefully we can, but there is, there is no guarantee that, that, that it can work. Right here in the front. Uh, Danny, I'll introduce yourself. Daniel Sower, I'm from uh, Johns Hopkins, SICE. Uh, 
Is there an implied territorial settlement in the oil and financial deal? And if not, uh, how do you foresee that being handled? Um, no, there is no uh, implied territorial settlement. We made it quite clear when we went to Baghdad that, that while we have several issues that, that we have with Iraq and several issues where we need to reach an agreement with um, the federal government in Iraq, that it was not the time nor the place to discuss all of those agreements. Our, our intentions were quite clear. We wanted to reach an agreement on exports and a reaching agreement on settling the budget issues. Um, now we have a bit of breathing space where we can actually have separate teams working with our partners in the federal government to deal with the territory issues and to deal with the disputed territories and Article 140 issues. We can work on, again, finding that elusive hydrocarbons law, the revenue sharing law, the issues of Peshmerga and the integration into the larger defense um, structure of the, of, the, of the Iraqi state, determining what we mean by 17%, what is sovereign expenditures, what are not. These are really complex issues and, and they're not easy to resolve. We haven't been able to resolve them now for, for 11 years, but now I think we've, we've got a little bit of the contentious issues out of the way. We've started on a, a trust building process um, we're generating some goodwill on both sides, um, and I'm, you know, I wouldn't say optimistic, but I have to be cautiously optimistic that if we continue along this trajectory with the, with the right kind of attitude that we're seeing now um, from both sides, that we could actually start to make some real inroads on some of these big issues. That's our question here. Uh, Amal Modellelli with Wilson Center. It's good to see you in Washington. Okay. Uh, my question is concerning your uh, emphasis on the importance of having a political process that brings the Sunnis back to the uh, fold. Uh, could you please give us your assessment uh, after the last few months of the government? Is this government doing what needs to be done to bring the Sunnis in? And how much influence Iran has on this process? Thank you. Um, uh, I, th I think what the shock of the war has really preoccupied everybody, both in Kurdistan, in Baghdad, and the shock of the, the financial crisis that has hit both sides as well has also preoccupied those that are not working on the, the war and on the security front. Um, but I don't think that, uh, I'm hopeful that there is an understanding that it, we cannot go on as business as usual um, out of Baghdad and, and uh, you know, attempts to, to rule Baghdad uh, rule Iraq from Baghdad, we, we have to get away from that. And, um, uh, you know, to, to keep Iraq united, we have to decentralize it. This, this is my opinion. This is the Kurdish opinion. It's, we've been saying this for, the, for the, the last, I don't know, several decades, even before the liberation effort. Um, the way to keep Iraq united is to implement what is written in the Constitution, which is execute and implement federalism. Um, now, that can take many forms. It can take many shapes. Um, we have s this partial deal with Iraq that we've, we've reached with Baghdad is a form of actually implementing that federal model that we had in, in mind where we contribute to the national exports, we receive our share of the revenues. This could be built upon and this needs to be built upon to include other communities um, in the country. Whether it's in the same shape or form as the Kurdistan region, I don't know. But that dialogue has to begin. That dialogue has to be a serious dialogue. And that has to be an understanding that that is the only way forward, that, that there is such skepticism um, uh, in Iraq right now that any attempts to try to create a, a, a new version of the old government, which, again, I want to say our impressions were very positive um, of, of, of the current government in and back that, but that needs to be built upon, not just with us, uh, with others. Iran, of course, plays an important role in this, and I think it's important for Iran um, to play a positive role in this and, and to realize that, that attempts to alienate and sideline Sunni communities in, in Iraq is not going to solve Iraq. It's going to break Iraq. It's going to make Iraq f fail as, as a state, and that, I think, the Iranians are smart enough to, to realize that and, and um, not to push it too far. I, I was talking to a senior U.S. official who argued that the, the part of the debate in the government is whether the U.S. should find elements of leverage to try to push uh, the prime minister 
to be more inclusive, to push toward the sort of political solution uh, you're talking about, and others who say, well, he's weak, one has to give him space. And, and it would be a mistake for the U.S. to find more elements of leverage. How would you help those people do their job better? Are there areas where you think it is helpful for the U.S. to, to lean in? Are there areas where you think the U.S. should just keep its hands out of it because it only makes it more difficult? I, I think, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant question. I, I'm not sure how, how to answer it. But the reality is we went to Baghdad and we struck this deal with Baghdad without having to be coddled by the Americans or by anybody else. There was no third party in the room trying to broker this deal between the Karachi and Baghdad. Now, that's not to take away any efforts leading up to that talk by the U.S. ambassador in, in, in Iraq, um, the, the folks from here. Um, so I'm sure the ambassador has been heavily involved in, in those discussions. So it's, um, you know, I think now that, that, that there is some progress in the talks between um, Erbil and Baghdad, the U.S. can play a role to make sure both sides stay true to their part of the deal. And the U.S. does have leverage. Of course, it has leverage. It always has leverage. Sometimes it doesn't realize that it has leverage, or it chooses not to realize that it has leverage. But the United States always has leverage, and they can apply that leverage effectively. Um, and I think they should apply that leverage effectively when it comes to the, the vision for the future of the country, not to impose its vision or how it thinks it should work, but certainly not standing in the way of, of, of a vision materializing that may look different from what some policy planners had in mind back in 2003 and 2004. There's a question all the way in the back. Yeah. yeah. Good hey. to see you again, sir. You too. Um, my question has sir, to can do. Can you identify yourself? I'm sorry. You're my name is Walt Slocum. Uh, I'm with the Atlantic Council. Uh, my my question has to do with the internal economy of Kurdistan. Uh, you're heavily dependent, presumably, on oil. How heavily, and what are your plans for stimulating the economy, which is not dependent on oil? Which, as an American, I wouldn't say it's bad news that the price is going down. Well, when when your when your economy is as dependent on oil as ours is, it, it is bad news for us. Um, so our economy is dependent on oil. And it, it is up until recently um, been heavily dependent on r us receiving our grants from the federal government. So in, in February, when that was cut, you think 95% of our revenue stream came from Baghdad. When that was cut, I mean, that, that economic shock on our system um, for many would have been unbearable. Thankfully, we had the outlet, we had the ability to speed up our own production uh, and to exercise our, our right to export um, out of Kurdistan, which alleviated some of that stress, but didn't actually fill the gap completely. But it is now very clear to us that we cannot be solely dependent on oil to, to function. Um, it's a good insurance policy to have, but it can't be our only insurance policy. So we are looking to diversify our revenue streams. We are actually right now debating a, a debt law in the Kurdistan region, which, which would allow us as the Kurdistan region to incur debt that would have no recourse to the federal government. Um, we don't want to make anyone in Baghdad nervous. Um, any debt that we would incur would be obviously our responsibility and, and our guarantee. Um, but that would help us kind of relieve some pressure, whether it's through issuing bonds or, or other forms of debt raising that could help finance certain strategic projects or to help fill our, our deficit gap. We also could do and should be doing a much better job at collecting other forms of revenues, electricity bills, water bills, uh, taxes, and, 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 and other fees that we have been pretty lax at over the years. I mean, the, I was shocked recently when I, I learned that the Department for Electricity of a province in Kurdistan is act actually owes the Ministry of Electricity money. It hasn't paid its electricity bills. So <laughs> this is the government owing itself money, um, which is a, you know, it, it, sometimes it can be shocking. But so there are things that we can do to diversify our own um, revenue streams and revenue incomes. But the reality is, until we start heavily investing in, in, in having much better agriculture and agro industries, other kinds of industries, putting in place more uh, robust kind of taxation and collection services, we are going to be regrettably, for better or for worse, heavily dependent on um, oil uh, and oil exports. 
uh, we are um, increasing our electricity output and, and we are have the potential to become a net exporter of electricity given the, the vast gas resources and reserves that we have in Kurdistan. That has been on our agenda. We have been working um, towards that. But again, this, this, you know, it has to be more, more coordinated and, and a more holistic uh, approach that we, we apply. This is the last question right here in front. Right here in front. Yep. Just wait. Thank you. My name is Hirsh Hussain. Actually, I'm a graduate student at Old Dominion University, and I'm Kurdish from the same city which Kobat is. My question is, Kobat, uh, I want a realistic answer, you know, specific. Why we cannot get separated from Iraq? Why we cannot build our own country? For example, when somebody asks me, where are you from? When I say, I'm from Kurdistan, he says, where's Kurdistan? And this question, uh, th this question takes 20 minutes to answer. Why well, cannot directly say I'm from Kurdistan, K-U-R-D-I-S-T-A? Thank you. That's a, it's a good question, and it's a question we get asked every day. It's a question sometimes we- have three minutes to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it, look, we could become independent. In fact, we have every grounds to become independent. If you go to any sort of international lawyer, if you, the grounds of genocide, genocide has been carried out against us. You talk about the diversity of our economy, of our, of our uh, society and the makeup of our society. We are ethnically diverse, our language is diverse, our culture is, is different from the rest of the countries. There are many aspects that, that make us, as Kurds, give us the, the groundwork to be independent, but we have to also realize that we are not neighbor to Luxembourg and Austria and other Switzerland and other countries where this would just be a normal, you know, emo you know emotionless decision. Uh, and, and that's, I think, that one of the difficulties we have as, as the, the, the leadership in Kurdistan is to balance our emotions and our feelings and what we think is right, what historical injustices that we feel as a people we have incurred. Um, to balance that with rational life and the protection of our own citizens and putting a, a, a system in place that could sustain any efforts to become independent. So if, in case we, we break off today, declare independence without agreeing with either Turkey or Iran, um, that would be problematic for us. I, I do see Kurdistan becoming independent one day, but I see Kurdistan becoming independent and having the best relationship with Iraq, not having a hostile relationship with Iraq. Because Kurdistan's sustainability as an independent country, um, and it will happen in our lifetime, uh, and I will say I do see that, but I don't necessarily see that in, in a hostile, conflicting kind of way. I see that as part of a natural progression um, of, of politics and of economy and, and of sound, rational decision making. Um, but right now to do it in the midst of a war and to do it in the midst of a crisis that would cause conflict with Iraq and probably cause con concern in Turkey and who knows what it would do with Iran um, would be um, irresponsible in the sense that it will put the lives and the security and the prosperity of Kurdistan at a potential risk. We've gone through a lot and our fathers and our grandfathers and, and those that are older than us have witnessed uh, horrible, atrocious things. Um, because of their Kurdish identity. Uh, we are now at a point, we thought we were at a point where we had peace, calm, stability. Unfortunately, we're back at war. Unfortunately, we have refugees again, IDPs again in Kurdistan, living in tents. These are things that we thought we had gone past. We thought we had finished with. Uh, I never thought I'd see the day where I'd see Kurds living in tents again, but unfortunately we do with a million and a half people from Iraq, including Kurds, including other communities that are today living in tents and we're approaching winter. Um, so we have to be responsible. We can't be emotional. We can't make these decisions based on knee-jerk emotional reaction. It has to be thought through. It has to be strategic. It has to be done in collaboration and in and coordination with those that we live amongst and with those that we live with and those that live, we, we live next door to. So um, I understand your passion. Um, you're not the only one that says I'm from Kurdistan when they're asked the question, um, but, you know, thank you. Um, 
We are out of time. We have covered a tremendous amount of ground in just under an hour. So you'll have to promise me that you'll come back and we'll cover even more ground. You don't need to twist my arm to get me Excellent. back to Washington. We look forward to seeing it's you. Great Thank to be you here. Thank you very much for Thank coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.